Hey, and welcome to The Office Field Guide, where I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. My name's Chris, and today we are looking at A Night Out. We're going to New York to party with Ryan and to meet girls. Yeah! A Night Out was written by Mindy Kaling and directed by Ken Whittingham. It first aired on April 24th, 2008, and actually took a dip in viewership with only 7.5 million people seeing it the night it aired. And that's coming off the 9.8 million people who watched The Chair Model. It's speculated that it may have been related to the other shows that aired in the lineup with The Office, like Grey's Anatomy and CSI, only having reruns the week that this episode aired. Either way, it currently has an 8.6 out of 10 on IMDb. And your trivia for a night out is, what is the name of the first nightclub that the crew visit? This place is like a, like a sexy preschool. First to get that right gets their name in next week's video, as well as the first person who spots the Easter egg. And if you're late to the video, leave an emoji sequence for next week's episode. I guess there's been a little confusion about the emoji sequence. It's right here in the stat sheet for everyone's enjoyment. So it's kind of a big deal. With that, let's get this terrible night started. <laughs> I understand nothing. First up, remember when I said to watch Ryan's wardrobe earlier this season? Well, we've officially transitioned to the next stage of Ryan's development, which I'll just call spiraling. As a bearded man, I've always appreciated this joke. Or makes fun of his height or his half beard. Okay. Actually, I've appreciated almost everything there is about this conference room scene. It's as close as we get to a killing field in this stretch of season four. Do you have a question, Kelly? Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Number one, how dare you? Ryan's website's failing, and that's the entire gimmick of this episode, is that everyone needs to come in on Saturday to re-enter those sales, which they all seem to have a problem with, but they don't question the legality of it at all, which I get, I, everyone's concerned about their job. Watch your back, Tim. Okay, but speaking of Jim, I've always been a little bugged by this line. So I caught everyone before they left and I told them my idea. And they loved it. Because this is a group that respects good ideas. I mean, it's obviously foreshadowing because we're all familiar with these people. We know it's not going to go well. And he should also be acutely aware of how these people turn on him on a dime. What are we talking about? Nothing. Nothing going on. We're talking about nothing. Come on, gang. And while I'm nitpicking things on this episode, a great callback interaction that we were robbed of would have been Michael inside of Ryan's apartment where we see this flat screen TV. Seeing Michael fixated on that TV would have been great as we know that he's an avid TV lover. I will just stand here and watch television for hours. I love it. I love this TV. And one more nitpick that might actually just be a nod and not a goof, but Michael's referencing The Wire here watching The Wire recently. I don't understand a word of it. It's great. I love it. It's a great moment. But Michael's about to meet Holly in just a few in-universe weeks, who looks astonishingly like Amy Ryan in that series. But I'll give it to them. She does have that Crawfordness that Michael's looking for. Okay, so what else? There's a ton of extras in minor roles in this episode. The actor who makes out with Dwight went on to do a few roles, but ultimately became a far-right news anchor, which I think checks out with Dwight politically. Now you believe in Dwight's traditions when some Democrat looks it up on Wikipedia? The lady who pushes Ryan down is a stunt actor who's been in a ton of stuff, including Fear of the Walking Dead, The Purge, the upcoming Suicide Squad, Transformers, and a lot more. Troy Underbridge is played by Noel Peetock, who seems to be mostly involved with The Office as he made a few appearances throughout that series. And his name is a clever reference to his fairy tale origins, I guess. Do you live in a regular sized house? Okay, I have some controversies I want to talk to you guys about. First, was this racist? Cleaning people. Oscar. They happen to speak Spanish. Fuck like yes. I've always struggled with how to read this interaction. I did read that Nunez spoke to them in a Cuban dialect, as that's where he's from in reality, and not Mexico, where he plays in the show. Okay, and the next thing is, I always felt like they're throwing in on Jim and Pam at this point, but do small offices like this actually tip their security guards? Is that a thing, or were they just wanting to vilify PB&J? By show of hands, who thinks we're a better couple than Jim and Pam? Also, wouldn't Hank have noticed the entire parking lot full of cars before he locked the gates? Okay, and I can do this all day with this episode, so let's get to the deeper meaning. Wow. 
What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Captain. Okay, so this one is pretty interesting, I think. This episode has some parallels with a children's book called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, written by Judith Vorst. I think that's how you say that. It follows this whiny kid as he goes about his day, which mildly awful things happen to him, like gum in his hair, and his brothers keep getting lucky. The main difference here is that instead of just one person having a bad day, there are a few people who are having a bad day that have a completely different story to tell. Michael wouldn't say he woke up with gum in his hair, but that is the event that triggered his bad day. I got gum in my hair. You do? This just stinks. Don't touch it. Please don't touch it. He had to listen to some people be mean about Ryan. In our virtual paper store. And then an older gentleman asked to boxers or briefs. Also, maybe he came to the conclusion that he had his identity stolen. Nobody would go on this site because we were worried about getting molested or losing our identity, having it stolen. When he gets to the club, he puts himself out there and gets rejected and rejected again. And meanwhile, Dwight's looking out without even trying. What are you doing, man? It's not safe. Anything could have been in there. Nice try. Ryan's bad day would start off with him having to defend why the Scranton branch is having to work on a Saturday to cover up his website's poor performance. Also, is he embezzling money? He mentions that Troy is a wizard with money, and then they're talking about Cabo when Michael walks up. It's always made me think that there's something more going on here that we never actually find out and Ryan never got caught for. Anyway, he'd go on to say that he got really messed up, couldn't get into a club, even by saying his name was Ryan Howard, the baseball player, got in a fight with a lady, and spent the night with Michael and Dwight. Guys, I'm going to sleep. You can leave the light on if you want, but please stop talking, okay? So, a pretty bad day for Ryan. Jim and Pam, on the other hand, would say that their bad day started by trying to save everyone from working on a Saturday, only to realize that they inadvertently locked the entire group into the office grounds. At which point, everyone gradually turns on them, while Toby, for some reason, begins to look like a hero. <laughs> And a reoccurring motif in the Alexander book is his desire to flee to Australia. I have an announcement uh, to make. I am moving to Costa Rica. So everybody's having a bad day in this story. So how does the book end? Well, it ends with him sitting there pouting and his mom telling him that everyone has bad days, even people in Australia. So the message of the book and this episode is that stuff happens and no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you can't avoid that. Alexander would have these bad days in the States just as he would in Australia. Michael would have bad days if he got that corporate job or not. More than that, Michael would have a bad day even if he were in a relationship or not. And lastly, Toby would have bad days whether he's in Scranton or not. I'm in zip lining my third day in Costa Rica. I guess the harness wasn't strapped in exactly right. I broke my neck. With that, let's dish out some dundies. Then I gotta get him to the Dundies. The cringe so hard I can physically feel it, Dundee, goes to Paul Lieberstein. So, I'm just gonna hop the fence and jog home now. I read that I had to do this so many times because everyone broke character each time it happened. I also read that Lieberstein wanted to do this stunt himself, but Daniels refused it, and they had it stunt double perform it. Interestingly, they didn't do the same thing with Meredith. Go along! Woo! Oh! Oh, God. Oh. And the Dundee for finally getting the name right goes to Creed Bratton. Hank, his name is Hank. Oh, guys, his name is not Hank, it's uh... Oh, thank you, Hank. With that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> okay, the cold opening is great. And I'm telling you that this joke. Wow, a lot of calories. Well, just don't leave it on too long. It hits me right where it needs to. I think that if we were to compare the late seasons to the early seasons of The Office, it's simple character situation jokes like this that stand out against the slapstick. So credit goes to Kaling there, but who actually knows who penned that joke for sure. I'll give this opening a four out of five. It got negative points there mainly because it lacks something truly memorable. As in, if I were sitting around with a bunch of friends talking about cold openings from The Office, which I do all the time, 
I don't think anyone would even mention the one where Michael gets gum stuck in his hair, but it did do a good job of setting up the deeper meaning, so there we go. As for the episode, this one, on paper, I have every reason to love this episode. It's funny. I am a bank teller. Brian told me to always tell women you work in finance. It's got heart. And how can I be lonely with my boys? It has cringe. <laughs> And honestly, that's the trifecta of office writing. On top of that, I have the utmost respect for the director, Whittingham. I think he's a great episodic television director and overall a cool human being. So why do I not like this episode? Well, I think it boils down to what we actually see on screen. I think this episode, again, lacks a true moment of hope for the characters. I get that Michael has this cathartic moment at the end of this one. I disagree. I say, let's hear it for the boys. But there's no real redemption for anyone. We don't see the captive staff get released. We just see that Jim didn't call Hank to tell him not to come. Son of a- We get a glimpse that Ryan admits he has a drug problem, first seen in this episode, but any hope of him actually getting help quickly gets dashed. And then Toby just potentially ruins his life. And then boom, episode ends. And on top of that, Michael's moment seems to be trying really hard to show us that he learned something. But what did he learn? He's just had some naive fun with his pal and his protege boss. So for all of that, I'm giving this one a two out of five. That's the lowest I've given anything since the Back From Vacation episode in season three. It's funny, The Office is a source of comfort for a lot of people, and I'm acutely aware of criticizing an episode like this is potentially stepping on someone's favorite episode. So leave a comment defending this one. You'll be wrong, but we'll all listen. The channel's growing, and I appreciate everyone coming out and watching each week. We have a Discord where we can chat about these episodes a little bit more personally if you'd like. You can join that if you want. And if you're particularly passionate about what I'm doing here, check out the Patreon. There's two levels. One is just a tip jar, which I really appreciate, and the other gets folks access to the inner circle. There is no inner circle. Either way, I hope you're enjoying these. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Troll Underbridge is played by... <laughs> <laughs> Troll Underbridge. Troy Underbridge is played by Noel Peacock. Peacock.